So today what we're going to talk about is we're going to go over heat transfer. So we're going to start off with heat exchangers. We're going to go over some more general applications, uh, maybe step through some software a bit. Uh, in terms of formulas, we're just going to get into enough so that you kind of understand how they work or just remember how they work so that uh, you have to manipulate them to be able to change your outputs for some of these selections um, and just understanding some of the changes that we're making. So we're going to go from some heat exchangers. And we're going to kind of dabble around, just see what everybody's interests are. Uh, the plan, though, is from heat exchangers to going into heat pumps and hydronics. Um, everybody's probably familiar by now and encountered a lot of heat pump items. Uh, but more often than not, they're getting uh, now on the commercial scale being incorporated with hydronic systems, large degree heat transfer medium. Um, and then from there, just some other stuff. Maybe we'll, we'll uh, I got uh, some slides on uh, cogeneration, how we've looked at system sequences. And ultimately, the point about it is just, you know, we can have the most efficient equipment in the system, but if we're not getting them all to sync together, it's, it's almost, uh, it's just, a, it's a waste. So uh, that's kind of the point of the last piece. And then from there, if there's any item that maybe we want to spend more time on, uh, be happy to, to kind of go back or run through. Uh, but every year what we're trying to do is we're trying to make adjustments to this, to, to these, uh, these classes. Uh, and so uh, the feedback that we get, and we'll send you some uh, surveys, any feedback, you know, we, we take it and we try to make changes for the next year. All right. So <clears throat> George is going to uh, man the questions online in person. If anyone asks anything here, I'll just uh, try to repeat it for everybody online and then uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So then if we break it down even further, just the section on heat exchangers, uh, well, we're gonna start off with just some common types of, of heat exchangers and different methods of heat transfer, and then work our way into some basic heat transfer equations, some design examples. And then you know, once we run through that, we'll be able to see some of the impact of the parameters that we're setting. And then from there, some rules of thumb, some tips, um, just to kind of end it with. <clears throat> so let's see here. So what is a heat exchanger? So a heat exchanger is, it's all in its name. It's exchanging heat. It's a heat transfer device with a purpose to transfer energy from, from one item to another. In this case, we're gonna be focusing on, on uh, water to water heat exchangers, steam, heat, steam to water heat exchangers. I mean, that's gonna be a bulk of what we do. So we're gonna focus our attention there. Uh, ultimately, the laws of physics, hot's going to go to cold, and, um, and uh, you know, generally, and nothing that we encounter is really going to have any sort of mixing, and they're going to be isolated. So whether it's a, uh, you know, a shell and tube that we're going to get into, and it's the shell wall of, on, the, on the tube bundle or the tube bundle wall, or whether it's a, um, you know, the uh, thermal plate on a, a plate and frame type unit. So, oops, here. All right, perfect. So these are the most commonly used in the commercial uh, building services uh, sector. So we have our generic uh, plate and frame heat exchanger gasketed. You might be receiving that referred to as a GPX or a GPHE. Uh, ultimately, it's a unit on the far right where we have the gaskets between each one of the plates. Uh, we have the brace plate on the bottom left. Um, that one is where we have, uh, we have a vacuum brace uh, on every single plate, so we don't have any gaskets in those units. <clears throat> we're going to go through different types of units and some of the benefits of others. So right now we're just going to skim. And then the shelling tube, as you can see here, you've got uh, you've got one end where you can take it off. You've got a long tube bundle in there. Uh, let's break each one of these down. So the first one we're going to take a look at is the uh, shelling tube heat exchanger. <clears throat> on the bottom right, just gives you an idea of what would happen if you were to pull that tube bundle out. Uh, you'll notice that that tube bundle <clears throat> is not fixed on the far end, um, and so it's uh, it's uh, it, it's great in that as you have extreme temperature differences uh, between, let's say, your your coil side and your shell side, um, that it, the expansion contraction rate might not won't match up, but that tube bundle is almost floating in there. Um, so actually, take a step back. There are two different sides. You have what's the fluid that's within the tubes, and then you have the fluid or the steam that's on the outside of the tubes. So we have the shell side, which is on the outside, and then you have the tube side inside. So if you have extreme temperature differences, it's nice that you're really only fast, you're only fixed on, on one end, and you can get that, that fluctuation and give without doing any sort of damage to the unit. Um, some of the advantages to it is that there is quite a broad range of materials uh, for configuration. So uh, that's what allows us to get some of these higher temperatures and pressures by having these different material options available uh, in different custom configurations. Um, some of the 
disadvantages here we have is our, our low uh, heat transfer rate. And a lot of that comes down to, we don't have a lot of turbulence. You know, these walls of these, uh, these tubes are smooth, right? And so you might not get a complete, you're not going to get a laminar flow, but you're not going to get very turbulent flow either. Um, like you'll see with some of the other style units. Um, additional disadvantages or, or points when you would try to avoid them is if your intended purpose is to have uh, an approach temperature uh, that would be less than 10 degrees. And we're going to get into approach in a moment. Uh, and I'm going to repeat these a couple of times. Uh, additionally, it's not good for a temperature cross. And so we'll, we'll break those down. So next going on to the plate style heat exchangers, what you have is you have your, your plate and frame unit and that's our gasketing unit. Uh, that unit has uh, essentially alternating plates between you have your, your cold medium, your hot medium back and forth with the gasket in between. And then you have an outer frame uh, supporting those to, to, to stay together. Uh, the brace plate, just to mention again, the brace plate is just the difference is it's braced together. We'll break those down. The advantages of uh, plane frame units when compared to a shell and tube unit uh, is that they have the higher rate of transfer. We're going to repeat this a couple of times, but you're going to have a lot more turbulence. You're going to have higher velocities, going to result in turbulence. That turbulence is going to give you better transfer. Um, so, and you have a good temperature cross too. And so we'll get into how. When you have uh, when you have a hot and a cold liquid, really having a, a true counter flow, you can really maximize your uh, your heat transfer versus if they're both flowing in parallel, um, you're going to get a better what we call as an LMTD. Uh, the disadvantages is the limited choice of materials. So whether it's the limited type of gasket materials or different metals that we can press together, uh, the gasketed we do have more options. You know, we can get into uh, we can have titanium plates. We can have different options for stainless. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we don't, uh, uh, we don't have the same offering that we could do, let's say with the shell and tube, but a lot of these materials are, are quite resilient. So, um, you really don't need those additional options. Uh, and with those limited material options, that's kind of what gives us the limited temperature and pressure range. Everything we're going to deal with for the most part in our industry with maybe exception to 1% of projects, um, you, you should, we can likely do with the, with the plate frame in terms of pressure and temperature. Um, and there are also higher pressure uh, plate and frame units available. So it really becomes an issue. So going on to the next one. <clears throat> so let's see. Sure. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So what are these advantages and how do we have, how is it that we have these higher, higher heat transfer rates? So like I was mentioned before, you have these, you have the alternating hot side, cold side, hot side, cold side. And if you look at on the right hand side, that's a picture of if we took a plate, that's the gasket and, and the, the plate, the thermal plate looks like, you'll notice that it's got that chevron pattern and uh, it's kind of uh, like a corrugated, it, it's creating that turbulence and there are different patterns too. So if we're trying to make it so that one side has a, a lower uh, target pressure drop while the other side, uh, it's less of a concern, we can, we can, get these patterns to create the pressure drop more on one side or another by also creating enough turbulence to get that heat transfer. Um, the temperature approach goes back to what I was mentioning before about, um, about uh, being able to have that counter current. Uh, it's got some visuals to come up in a moment. Um, and these slide, this slide deck, this being clear, I like to think of a lot of it just kind of being a cheat sheet to review. So a lot of these bullets will just summarize. And then as you go further into the presentations, we'll get deeper into them. Uh, the temperature cross, which is something that, you know, we're not going to be doing with a shown two feet unit. Um, and let's see, the last piece to it that does provide that uh, better heat transfer rate is generally with a lot of these plates, you're going to see a plate thickness of 0 0.015, uh, while you would see a tube thickness at 0 0.025. So um, just that thickness alone is obviously going to, to impact the difference, make the difference. So here we have just um, just want to show a couple of different uh, the methods of heat transfer. Um, so let's say if we start with radiation as uh, energy transfer through electromagnetic waves. So if you think of like ultraviolet, you think of uh, you think of infrared, you think of microwave, you think of the sun. Um, that would be our our, um, our radiant energy. We, our convection would be more along the lines of. Um, the uh, the heat transfer from from the movement you know where oh sorry I'm I in I'm on a different slide here 
uh, you think of there's natural convection and there's uh, there's forced convection. Um, just uh, one 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 way that uh, someone's mentioned that to me before, and it kind of sticks with me is that you know natural convection would be, for instance, let's say if this pot right here was uh, um, was was pasta sauce and you you were cooking it. So you have your your radiation coming from uh, for, coming from your cooktop. You've got your your convection of the um, the tomato sauce, it, it'll turn over a little bit, but you're really not going to see a whole ton of it versus if we had, uh, if you were to stir it, you're going to have more even, uh, more even heat transfer versus burning the bottom, right? And expecting, um, expecting it to, uh, to heat evenly. So, um, you know, what we're doing in this case is we're, we're, we've got a form of a, like a, a forced convection through creating that additional turbulence. And I wouldn't look at any of these items when we're looking at the heat exchangers, all the software that you're using, we're, we're, the radiation would be the least significant because there's very little exposure to these heat exchangers, mostly the convection, the conduction. Um, and we don't really pick these items out uh, specifically in the software. Everything's already going to be populated, but just wanted to run through those two items before getting into the, getting into the next slide where we're just going to get into some of the heat transfer equations and some of the formulas that are more common. Just break them down, and then what we're going to do is we're going to twist them around and see how uh, see how they're going to impact some of our selections. Uh, so in this case, what we have is we've got our heat transfer front coefficient, where we have our, our overall heat transfer coefficient being calculated based on uh, our coefficient of our hot side heat and our cold side. So you can see on the far left, we have our hot fluid side heat transfer coefficient. The right side, we have our uh, cold flu, we have our cold fluid side heat transfer coefficient. Well, you'll notice in the middle, we've got the FFC is our, is our fouling allowance. We also have, we have that for our cold side and our hot side, as well as, uh, you know, our being our separation uh, through the wall resistance. This was simplified quite a bit uh, based upon uh, a couple of the, the factors we have below, but just for time and concept purposes, it, it was boiled down to this. Um, and we're going to go back to this in a, in a moment, but I just want to show that. Um, right here, we have, we are calculating our mass flow rate. So we're, we're looking at our, our load. And so when we take a load, I, I know that what George and, and I, what we've done in our class, a lot of times we'll, we'll simplify things where we'll say, um, you know, we'll say, um, you know, see 500 times the delta um, uh, times the GPM will give us our, our load when obviously the, that load is depending on many different factors, right? So it's depending on it, what's a glycol solution, what's a specific gravity, what's the, um, and what's the um, um, specific heat transfer of the fluid. So if we, we, so for a lot of the equations, we'll just assign 500. Uh, when it comes to when we're doing these selections and especially as we're scaling them out, um, you know, it's very important that we are factoring in the specific gravity and the specific heat transfer of these fluids, or a small percentage can be off by quite a bit. So right here, this is just assuming without a phase change. So this is just water to water. And without getting too far into it, ultimately, it's the same thing that uh, George mentioned before, where it's the GPM times the times, you know, 60 uh, minutes per hour times the weight of, of the gallon of water. Assuming it were, it were water, it would be a specific gravity of one. And that's, I mean, I'm gonna whiz through these a bit real quick until we get to the point here. Um, and the most important thing when it comes to uh, heat exchanger selection and um, impacts on your selection is going to be your LMTD. That's your log mean temperature difference. And uh, we'll show you how we're gonna calculate those. And um, so in this case, what we have is if you look at the top right hand side, we have the blue lines where we're coming in at the bottom, coming out of the top. But if we look at the, the hot water side, we're going the opposite way. So that's, that's a true counter current. A true counter current is going to give us get us that best heat transfer and get us that uh, that highest LMTD. Now um, the counter current is going to flow in different directions. And then I, I should have set this slide up to give a visual with each one of these items. And my visuals for the next part. So <clears throat> the approach temperature for the counter current is let's say is is the it's hot in minus hot out. So it's how close are we approaching the temperature? And then also on the hot side, how to hot out minus cold in. And we're gonna get two different temperatures there and I'm gonna show you how that impacts our LMTD. Um, this also gives us the ability to get the temperature across here. This is the slide I probably should have started with. 
So uh, look at the right hand side. We've got we've got uh, we've got the better way to look at the approach is the cold cold out hot in on the top right. That's our approach. That difference versus on the hot out and the cold in. So hot out minus cold in equals one temperature approach, and then hot in cold out equals another temperature approach. Now when when they're calculating the LMTD, uh, what they have here is a greater temperature approach terminal difference. Ultimately, it just means between those two uh, different approach temperatures, whatever the higher one, that's going to be that's going to be your GTD or G, GT or TTD uh, versus your your lesser would be obviously the smaller. Now, one thing that I don't have on here, but if the if they are equal, then that is your LMTD. So if one's five and one's five, your LMTD is five. If not, um, you would have to do the you know you would have to have the larger approach temperature minus the um, the low, the smaller approach temperature uh, divided by the natural log of the greater approach temperature divided by. So it can get a bit complicated, but let me show you the impact with an example. So in this case, in this case, what we have is we've got 95 coming in on the hot side, leaving at 85. The cold side coming in at 73, leaving at 82. And what we have up here, up top, uh, circled would be the approach for each. So the approach on, up top is 13. Approach in the bottom is 12. So if we plug that in, we're going to get 12.4 or about 12.5. Now, let's say if it was piped in correctly and somebody had it so that it was a, a, we didn't have that, that counter current, uh, then in that case, we'd be in a 95 out of 85. But then on the other side, we'd be looking at um, 73 to 80, 82 if it was reversed. In that case, we'd have a um, we have an approach of 22 at the top and an approach of three degrees in the bottom. And you look at that LMTD down below in the bottom right as a result of the 9.54. It doesn't look like a significant change, but that's about a 25% difference right there, which is going to directly relate to about a 25% difference in, um, in heat transfer, which results in about 25% difference in, uh, in, in surface area required. So. Um, when we start looking at some of these temperatures, we just want to make sure that um, that as we start getting close on our approach and shrinking that approach, that um, that the the scale of the unit, the price of the unit, you're not having a point of diminishing returns, right? You're getting an extra fraction of a degree for a system that maybe it might not matter as much, but it might be quadrupling the size of the unit. So it's just something to take a look at and just make sure that uh, we start with the equipment, what's necessary for that in the system, and then, and then build from there. But um, in the software, we'll show a couple of different options, but all right, here, just wanted to show with, with this one, trying to match both my screens up here. All right, so ultimately what this is showing is, this is just showing is that as your heat transfer rate increases, so if your heat transfer rate increases, your your required surface area decreases. Uh, same with LMTD. As the LMTD increases, your required surface area increases. Just like if we if we took a step back, you'll notice that we we had that that slight reduction in LMTD, but we we also provided a 25% less heat transfer. So think of as as we increase our heat transfer rate, our area goes down. As we increase our LMTD, our required area goes down. Now, when making a selection, it's kind of going more to the how, how we do it, actually go about selecting a unit. The first, we have to just confirm the fluid type. So we have to make sure that we have the correct type, temperature, temperatures, the volume is correct, the ratios. Um, when making a selection, the software will fill in the blanks. We call it floating. You can float different variables if you're unsure of what some variables may be. Uh, but we do need five of these seven items. So that's either your your cold fluid flow rate, hot fluid temperature, in or in and out, uh, cold fluid flow rate, uh, in and out, and then your heat load. So you can float them depending on what your priorities are. Uh, a big point to pay attention to though would be uh, pressure drop of each fluid. And and one of the tips that we've got towards the end is it's just confirming on the schedule that the that the pressure drop is clearly defined uh, and that when people submit on units that it's clearly defined. Uh, it's quite common that people will confuse feet ahead with PSI, which will give absolutely different results, completely different results. And we'll show the impact of um, how you can increase your heat transfer rate by allowing for a higher pressure drop, but then also by allowing a higher pressure drop, you're also 
um, accepting more power consumption or we cause a, a loss over time. Try to go to this next one. Anything online, George? Nothing, okay, perfect. So here's just an example where what we're gonna take a look at is um, is the first step would you be making sure that everything everything is order in terms of being balanced. So uh, we wanna make sure that uh, when we put things down on paper that, um, that, that they make sense so people know that uh, am I following the chiller water load or am I following the, the, the tower load? Um, so in this case, we have a thousand gallons a minute on the chilled water at uh, 57.8 entering, leaving at 53 with a pressure drop maximum of 10 PSI. On the tower side, we have 1500 GPM at 51 degrees coming in, 54 going, 54.2 going out. What we did is we just plugged this in into that, that um, to, to be able to determine our, our load here, and they do match at 2.4. Um, and so, so we can kind of, we get past that step. Here we go, we're sliding, here we go. Um, here we go, and then now we're taking a look at determining what the log mean temperature difference is. So we've got our approach temperatures, we calculate those down, we get our LMTD, we're at 2.72. So 2.72 for these existing conditions, this would be our, our LMTD. Now, what type of heat exchanger would everybody use in this case where we have a small approach and we have a temperature cross. Does anyone, did you go with the plain frame or would you go with the shelling tube? Right, you, we go with the plain frame. So with the shelling tube, ultimately we recommend uh, to keep the approach about 10 degrees or greater. Um, um, so 10 degrees or greater for, for shelling tube, uh, two degrees is the minimum uh, that we would like to um, uh, minimum that we would like to see with a plain frame unit. Uh, you'll start you'll see here when we start going through some examples that the sizes just really get out of hand as we as we start shrinking it down. All right, so we go with a we go with a plate unit, right? And then especially with that approach, and we've got the temperature cross. Now. What we're doing here is we're just we're just trying to determine now that we have now that we have our LMTD, we're going to plug in. We, we know our load, we know our LMTD, and what we're going to do is we're going to use a heat transfer coefficient that's pretty standard, um, generally in the industry with a 10 psi pressure drop, and so we're going to use 964 BTUs per hour per square foot. So we plug all that in, it gives us to a required area, a surface area of 915 square feet. So this is just what we're going to use as a base example. And so that's what we're going to say, all right, price index, let's say that this is the value one that we're in reference to. So let's say if we make a change from there and we say, for instance, we're now going to allow for a greater pressure drop. And like I said before, is if we have a greater pressure drop, uh, then that means a allowable pressure drop, we're probably we're going to have a higher velocity, right? Now, if we have a higher velocity, we're going to have more turbulence. And if we have more turbulence, we're going to have uh, a greater heat transfer coefficient. So that's why you see new, U now equaling um, 1100 or 1105 uh, per square foot. Now, in, in just plugging that in by changing that heat transfer coefficient by increasing that pressure drop, now we're resulting in a lower surface area where before our surface area was 915, now we're down to 798. And granted, um, it may, may, may not be a significant portion, but a 7% price in, index based off of the standard. Um, and depending on what, how important the pressure is and how it scales out, it's just a, a variable to think about. So you can increase your pressure, increase your velocity, increase your turbulence, decrease your surface area, resulting in a lower price. But then again, if you have that pressure drop all the time, if you, if you could avoid it, let's say it's not, a, uh, it's not a zone that's being balanced back as if it would be uh, wasted anyways. If if you're actually using this um, for your um, and, and it's not as it's a zone that you're basing your design system pressure drop across, um, you know you, it, may, it likely would not be necessary because over the life of the product uh, it would consume more power than you'd be saving with a seven percent reduction. Uh, and just an, another example is if we take a look at 
uh, the chilled water. And I think before we had a, uh, let's say we put the pressure drop back to 10, right? So we're, we're bringing that, uh, that velocity and that turbulence back down. But what we're doing is we're saying, okay, we're gonna take that flow rate that was at 1500 gallons per minute on the tower. And what we're going to do is we're going to drop it down to a uh, thousand gallons a minute. So ultimately when we drop to a thousand gallons a minute, to be able to maintain the same load, what we have to do is we just we would have to adjust the leaving water temperature to be able to make it so that it's balanced here. So all I wanted to show is that the last one was the impact of increasing the allowable pressure drop. This one just shows the impact of changing the approach. So it's changing the approach. It's going to change it on TD, which is going to change it. So we had a thousand gallons a minute instead of 1500. We let the leaving water temperature float, floated up to 55.8. In doing that, adjusted our approach. Now our approach, instead of I believe it was 2.7 before, we're at we're at 2.0, and the result of having an LMTD of two results in additional uh, required surface area. We're up to now 1,200, and on that heat exchanger selection example, uh, the price index it went up roughly 20% from the baseline. So. That the difference of a flow rate, which is significant, resulted in in that approach, which impacted our heat transfer coefficient, which impacted our surface area. So this is our software. Um, so when we were talking before about how we would need uh, five of the uh, seven, so what, what I'll do too is actually I'll just if I can just click this here. Yeah, so what I'm doing is I'm just jump. Let's see if everybody can see this here. George, what does it pop up with on your screen? Okay. And let me try to back out of this here. Share a new screen. How about now? Good? Okay. So this is the selection software that, you know, if anybody works with anybody in the building, on like looking for a selection. So uh, if anyone hasn't already explored it, you know, this is where we would make our, our pump selections. We can go with our system designer where we could put our own variables in and it'll build a system for us. But in this case, while we're still talking about heat exchangers, what I wanna do is I just wanna open ESP Thermal. Um, George, you're not logged into Thermal here, huh? Um, all right. So I guess we'll do okay, share a different screen. And are we back to the presentation now? You see that? Perfect. Okay. So ultimately this is the screen that everybody would see. If um if if, if things aren't balanced, it'll flag you with an error. Um but what I did want to show um, is that before this screen, it gives you options of your different types, right? So you're going to be able to say, I want a, a steam to water unit, I want a shell and tube unit, I want a plain frame uh, unit. Um, and in there, it also asks if you want to have an AHR 400 industrial, what your application is. Um, so what I'm going to do, sorry for all the uh, jumping around on here. Let's see if this works. Let's try this. Do you see a new PowerPoint yet? How about that? Okay. Awesome. All right. So let's say when, when somebody goes in to select a heat exchanger, if you select a plate and frame style or specifically a gasketed unit, uh, what there is, is uh, there's an item called HRI, it's uh, HRI standard 400. Ultimately, what it is, is that uh, all the different uh, heat exchanger manufacturers, uh, what they do is they have their equipment tested by a third party that's HRI, and they just validate that the performance that you're providing within your software is accurate. So they take your software outputs, they take your equipment, a sample of all of your equipment, they validate it in their lab, and then once it's validated in their lab, you then get certified. Um, and so it's a way that you get a peace of mind ultimately that um, that the equipment that you're getting will actually perform to the conditions that you designed it around, uh, which is which is very important. Now HRF standard 400. 
really only applies to uh, to uh, water units, uh, whether that's regular water or that sea water or glycol. It's glycol from 10 to 50 percent, um, and it's really only for condition space. So if you're you have an application where, let's say, for instance, you you've got a domestic water plant, well, in that case, you'd select the commercial uh, heating and heating and cooling. Uh, if it's conditioning space, you're always going to select the AHRI standard 400. If you've got an industrial application, um, you would you would select industrial. Uh, so if you have anything that's uh, let's say if you have steam, uh, then steam wouldn't fall under AHRI 400 standard 400. So you would go to industrial. Um, to my understanding, the difference between some of these is the uh, allowable tolerance in the material that they publish. Um, so if you always want to make sure that things have been tested and proven to the exact design conditions, uh, the safest bet is to do it to the HRI 400. Um, the last one is uh, ASHRAE 90.1 water side economizer. Ultimately, that really is HRI standard 400. The only difference that they make in the software is that when you go to set, when you go to select, you know, put your parameters in, that it already has your uh, your allowable pressure drop factored in. Um, to, to match with the HRI uh, with uh, ASHRAE 90.1, but ultimately it is uh, standard 400. So I just wanted to put this in there because um, it's uh, it's worth knowing if somebody's submitting on something that if it's anything that's conditioning space or anything that's really that's critical or important. Uh, 90 uh, the, the ASHRAE 400 standard really um, I guess is a is a way to make that maintain make sure that your conditions are maintained. You target where your intention is. Uh, but like I said before, if you're not conditioning space and it's not a critical item, maybe it's a swimming pool, uh, maybe it's a, a domestic water system, uh, or it's a form of some sort of heat recovery. In those conditions, um, you know, you can save quite a bit for your customer by looking at some of the other options. Um, but I would definitely look through when, when people are submitting on the equipment, because whether it's, um, whether it's uh, people's software is defaulting at 10 feet or versus 10 PSI, or you see uh, you see the notes in there about um, uh, different applications. About uh, one thing I didn't mention on the shell and tube. So in the shell and tube units and plate and frame units, let's say if you're working on a domestic water system, I'm not sure how many of you work in, on the plumbing side. Anyone? Okay, is that some plumbing systems? Uh, so maybe we're looking at a, a double wall selection, uh, making sure that we get an air gap. So ultimately, that would just mean is that on our heat exchanger, let's say if we're looking at a, a plate and frame or a shell and tube in between that thermal wall and the next, uh, between the two heat transfer mediums, that there's actually a second wall and there's an air gap. So if one wall were to fail, that we're leaking out the atmosphere, um, the benefit of that is making sure that nothing's crossing over and leaching into to drinking water. Um, granted, in many situations, the uh, the potable side is at a higher pressure, so it would leach in the other direction, but um, there's still something to do, especially if there's how the water is being treated. Um, let's see. And then, see. Yeah, in terms of the industrial, for the most part, those selections, I think that you're going to see that they're going to force you into industrial when you start making steam selections. I would, I could, I would say most people here probably aren't working with a lot of um, uh, oils and uh, different process applications, but if you are, um, that's an option. What we have in the software too is we have different indicators for guidance. So uh, everybody's got them, every manufacturer, but it's good so that if you have a lot of this was over the surface, but um, if you have any particular things that you want to deep dive a little bit into with these presentations, you probably just do a control F. I put a lot of notes at the bottom. Um, my notes are probably a lot better than what I've presented so far. So uh, I think that it would be uh, good for a future reference. Um, and there's something that sometimes I look back to. Uh, let's take a look here. So. What I'm going to try to do during the break is to log into system wise just so I can kind of walk you through some of the selections and how we made the changes. But in the meantime, I'm going to make a, uh, a transition over to where we're starting to see refrigeration and hydronics collide. Um, now, it's happening on the space heating side as well as the domestic side. Uh, this presentation I have is just an example of the domestic side uh, where we have a that come up. Perfect. Okay, where we have a, a heat pump water heater. And how do I do? 
trying to get this to be a full screen, but I've got a bar that pops up. Okay, there we go. All right, so this presentation, I mean, you skip past. Ultimately, the brand we have is Lock and Bar. Uh, so Lock and Bar, it's an American brand. Um, just a table of contents for, for the presentation, why he pump technology, just refrigeration overview. We're not gonna get too deep into that. I just wanna show how some of these systems are being integrated. Um, ultimately, with uh, when it comes to heat pump technology and electrification, it's it's the direction that we're, we're going. Um, you know, you could get into grid composition and down that comp, that, that talk, but you know, the grid um, you know, has been promised to be greener over the, the coming years, and uh, the technology is doing what we can to shift over. Uh, right now, what we're doing is, um, you know, outside of uh, responsibility with FIA, one of the things we're doing with ASHRAE is uh, we're actually doing some work in, in New York with NYSERDA. So um, I mentioned this because it'll relate back, but the New York State um, Energy Research um, and uh, whatever authority, ultimately what they're doing is they've, they've got, we thought of well, what's one of the hardest markets to, to decarbonize, and that would be, um, that would be healthcare, right? I mean, the, the responsibility of healthcare is, uh, is to make people healthy, and that's priority number one, right? It's, uh, it's uh, the life safety items. Um, and um, there can be a lot of challenges. Lab space, I guess there's also an argument for it. So the plan is uh, we've got, we've got about, uh, about 150 stakeholders, everything from a lot of folks at the facility staff level to uh, folks at the uh, board level for the hospitals to design engineering firms, to architects, uh, to, to reps, to just subject experts. And what, we're, what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to, there hasn't been a lot of updates in terms of a lot of the standards for uh, for the healthcare industry, especially with guidance regarding to decarb, um, we're trying to do, what we've tried to do is we've tried to take a lot of stuff and bring it together, and it's a conversation that could potentially take years. But um, you know, I think that the, the movement's going to be a lot faster with some of the changes that, to the approach. So one of the things, you know, we just started this in the past year, and we think that we're going to have draft one done by August. They say that sounds absolutely nuts for things that you know take decades to develop, but um, I'm sure everybody's, you know, worked with open AI and all of these different items. Now, what we've used is we've, there's a, uh, there's a consensus AI where what we've done is we've had taken everybody's comments on each one of these different sections that we've put together, positive, negative, uh, you know, questions, concerns, and we actually put it into the model and he was able to sift through and figure out wh what sections do people already agree on and there isn't a debate about, and then just remove that from the conversation. Uh, so that we can just and then then take a lot of questions that are at the same root point and boil them down together um, so we anticipate that we should have a playbook and a toolkit to uh, for hospital administrators so there are different sections hospital administrators um, at different levels of, of the design uh, process that people can receive guidance of what are their first steps what are the low-hanging fruit uh, and then from there once we finish this toolkit and design guide what we're doing is we're working with uh, you know the New York legislature to make commitments off of that, which would then force these different hospitals and agencies to start adopting these uh, these procedures. Um, and then the interesting part about it is that you know and then we just roll it over to lab space and we we take on all the hurdles of lab space because hey, we we started at the top of the mountain, the two hardest things. We're able to work on those, and that's not going to be done. It's going to take years. Uh, and then from there, multifamily, uh, you know, just regular commercial use, a lot of these things will kind of fall on the line. But I mean, the goal right now is that uh, we think that in the next five years, we should have a handbook uh, pretty well defined for all market segments and have them adopted around most of the country. Here in Boston, you know, we've got a lot of expectations just with Birdo. Uh, we've had the emissions reduction disclosure for years now. Uh, it won't be long before, um, before there are fines. You know, when we sell high efficiency products in the past, uh, it was off of the the future savings. Now it's really fine avoidance uh, because of the, the, the fines in the future. So there's a lot of reasons to shift that way, but it's just a little bit of what's going on and how where things are going in the future. <clears throat> this is just a couple of units, a couple of commercial heat pump water heat commercial heat pump water heaters. We've got newer models out that are that are more efficient. As time goes on, you're going to see them all working at lower ambience. These uh, this first one, it's an air to water unit. Um, we have that uh, up to um, up to 272,000 BTUs an hour. Now this unit here it works down to about 27 degrees. The new units uh, that are coming out are uh, 
are, are, are still, you know, in the, in the low twenties, but just maintain the performance better. Let me skip through this. I'm not going to make it too much about our products. Just talk about the concepts, uh, but you can always go back and see the, these details. So I just want to show with some of the air source and there, there's a, this is a big point is that, that where are we taking this energy from? So a heat pump in the basic sense is that we're taking heat from one place and shifting it somewhere else. We're using a refrigeration cycle. We're manipulating, you know, temperature for pressure or pressure for temperature. And we're transferring whether it's in your house and you are rejecting heat outdoors to create for the cooling indoors, or you're, you know, rejecting heat indoors and cooling outdoors towards outdoors. So it's, we're, we're shuffling it from one place to another. And the problem with that, that we've seen a lot, and at least I would like to say, I wish it was just residential, but also commercially is, um, you know, commercially, we have some of these places where we don't have waste heat. So they have a room, you're looking to put a heat pump water heater, there isn't any waste heat. Um, you know, a heat pump water heater, it's extracting energy out of that air. Well, if we don't have waste energy in that air, and we have, we're going to kick on a baseboard or an electric fan coil unit to be able to support this. We're, we're switching pockets. We're not getting the efficiency. So uh, one of the most important things when it comes to making the selections on uh, a lot of these types of units is just thinking, where is its true efficiency coming from and how do I make it work for, for my conditions? Because it's not just this, there's, there's other products that are being misapplied. So in this case, somebody, if they said, okay, well, it has to be inside. Well, in that case, you get a blower model and uh, you duct it to the outdoors. Um, but then again, then you look at the details and let's say my power consumption is through the roof and maybe that efficiency I was anticipating for a payoff, you're not going to get. So you got to look at the big picture. Um, so that's another thing. Well, we can, beyond getting into the conditions and, and challenges of, of low ambience, um, trying to figure out where the equipment's applied. What this just shows here is this just shows uh, for an axial unit, if you were to do a multi-pass, I'm going to show a diagram just showing multi-pass and a uh, uh, single pass. Multiple Multi-pass just means it goes back and forth from the tank to the unit many times before it gets up to temp. And that's why you see the different efficiencies at each one of these entering water temperatures and leaving water temperatures. But um, you know, I think what you're going to see a lot more of would be single pass. And this is uh, the performance of a uh, of single pass. All right, I'm skimming through this to try to get a couple points in. So we don't need to look at the duct work. Ultimately, when, when we are combining these systems, we do have to make sure that obviously that, um, you know, our airflow is balanced. We're not pulling a negative in a room by pulling air from one room, blowing it into another. We need to make sure that there are any sort of chemicals or solvents or anything in the air with, with some of these, these items. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to stay a little bit away from the plumbing and kind of focus more on concept. So. The water source units, uh, there's a lot of opportunity out, the, uh, out there for water source units with the geothermal, uh, or it could even just be waste heat, um, and uh, especially with IRA and uh, the, the tax credits, it's, it's pretty attractive these days. There's a lot of folks in that market. Uh, this just shows uh, the refrigeration cycle. Now, in this case, where we have a, uh, we have a heat pump water heater, what we're doing is we're rejecting the heat into uh, from the condenser into the pipe that's going to the storage tank. So if you look at the top where we have our where we have our uh, our condenser, that's where your water is being circulated to and from your storage tanks. And then if you look at the bottom heat exchanger, that's where you'll see our evaporator. And ultimately, our our evaporator is going to and from our source. So whether that's your 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 waste or whether it's to your your ground loop. Um, this just shows the efficiency as of those as multi-pass as single pass um, you know and all these units will have options we'll talk about some of these options in the in the diagrams so we can skip the voltage uh, one thing that's this is this applies to ours and many of the other folks out there is that you know, we always pay attention to the details of when units are operating so let's say if somebody publishes that though you know unit will operate um, uh, will operate down to uh, 35 degrees we'd say okay well uh, it does it have elements on it? And if so, what temperature do those kick on? So you might, in this case, have elements that are heating up your evaporator, uh, maybe starting at 40 degrees. So maybe it's 40 degrees you want to switch off and, and go over to your gas appliance or uh, just straight to a resistive element in the storage tank. Um, so there's a lot of fine detail in the new technology. Uh, we skip all that standard controller. All right, so I'm just going to skip straight to the diagrams. So what I'm just showing here, just so people are familiar with, with some of the things that uh, that's going on uh, on the heat pump water heating side, is that um, um, in that 
some manufacturers are only able, this this is an example of a, a, a multi-pass system. So you'll notice it taps into the bottom of the tank. It just circulates to and from the heat pump water heater. You'd refer to that as a, as a multi-pass. It's passing multiple times to get to set point. Now, this is where people may be less familiar with is single pass. So we're coming in, we're piping the unit similar to how we would pipe a high efficiency water heater in that the inlet pipe, let's see, everybody see this? Just getting some my cursor here. All right, so this inlet pipe here, we tease in off the cold so that as someone's drawing, let's say they're drawing off the system, drawing off the system, as water's coming, coming in to replenish the water being lost, rather than recirculating it from the bottom, we start pulling it in from the street. So we're getting the coldest potential water. Now, if we're getting the coldest potential water, thinking about the conversation we had earlier about, um, about that uh, approach temperature and that LNTD, the, the greater we can get these, some of these temperatures um, you know, between the refrigerant and that cold water, uh, we're really gonna squeeze a bit more efficiency out. Now, if we went back to the single pass chart in terms of performance, you'll notice that they do have a greater output, but it's the result of our conversation earlier about you know, having that greater approach temperature. So in this case, we have, we have single pass and that's just for one storage tank. Now, if we were to do single pass and two storage tanks, you'll notice that the storage tanks are in series. Ultimately, two storage tanks in series is the same idea as if you had one really tall tank. It's um, hydraulically would be, would be very similar. Uh, you're, you'll get your stratification. The, the purpose of that is so that, let's say if your system is drawing in and water's coming in, it's drawing in at a faster pace than the water that's being pulled from here into the, into the, the heat pump. Heat pumps, if it's got a high delta, it's got a fixed output, it's gonna have a low flow rate. So if at any point there's a very large draw off the top of the, of the, top of the tank, what would happen is the bottom of these, these tanks will start getting colder and colder and colder and colder. And you'll have certification where the top of this tank will be at set point. Most will be on set point, you'll have a thin film, it'll be cold, cold, cold. The benefit of piping in series like this is that, just like what I mentioned before, that greater temperature difference. So as we're drawing down, we're getting that coldest water versus if we had multi-pass and as we're approaching our set point, we're at 100, maybe at 120 degrees, 130 degrees of these tanks in parallel, um, that water is, is going to be significantly warmer, dropping our efficiency. Um, all this is just showing, this is the same thing, just showing with a second heat pump. In this case, what, be, what someone would do is they would wire, they would have the two heat pumps in, in parallel. Um, all right, without getting too far into it, let's see, single pass. All right, so there's a lot to unpack here. Ultimately, we got our, we've got our, our single pass unit. So there's, we've got our, our heat pump water heater. We're pumping out. We're pumping into this uh, heat, pump, heat pump water heater. I'm sorry, into the storage tank. Um, let's say as the system, as the system starts drawing off, it'll, first it'll draw through this electric backup or swing tank, they refer to it. Um, a swing tank is often, um, kind of given this backwards, sorry about that. Uh, a lot of times, at least in California and the West Coast, uh, they require a swing tank. Uh, that's what they refer to this as, an electric tank. That's the last tank in series before the mixing bell. Uh, the purpose of it, at least uh, in the West Coast, is to, they call it maintenance of the research, just maintaining that research line. Um, so that you're not constantly cir circulating water through your storage tanks when you're trying to, you're trying to get stratification. So, so if you have a, a moderately small unit as your swing tank, then it's a swing tank. Other functions that you can serve as is you can also serve it if it's large enough, maybe it's a backup. If your heat pump goes down or it's unable to keep up, uh, if, it's, if it goes down, then it's a backup. If, if the heat pump's running, but it just can't keep up with that system load and you've already, you've already drawn down your entire thermal storage, well, then this acts almost as a peak shaver. I don't know how to get rid of all those lines. So, um, there's, we, we got to kind of be creative. Now, we will notice here, it, it's been, we're, we've got some challenges in the industry. This doesn't just apply to domestic water heating with, with, with heat pumps or, or uh, also to, to space heating with heat pumps. Um, you know, we, we have some design challenges that, like in this case, for instance, um, heat pump water heaters 
uh, we sell heat pump water heaters. We sell gas. We sell we, we both. So I'm trying. I'm trying to just look at it, have a pragmatic approach here, and be non biased. But um, the units are quite expensive. I mean, if you look at our heat pump water heater, they can easily be seven, eight times the price of our high efficiency top of the line gas units. Um, so what we've done to try to make it so that some of these projects can even move forward because the cost is just hard for for most uh, most building owners to swallow is what we've done is we've upsized the storage and we downsized the, the heat pump. Uh, in doing that, we can we can create a significant cost. And then at the same time, uh, I think that most would agree that the heat pump technology is going to continue to evolve over the next decade. Uh, and I think that there's going to be a lot of improvements. So personally, I like the idea of putting more of my investment into uh, a non-moving part that's going to sit there, that's reliable. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's one way to do it. So, you can upsize your storage, downsize your heat pump. And then at the same time, people will say, well, we still need to have some sort of a backup. So that's when you look at, okay, well, can I, can I put elements in my storage tanks? Can I upsize my, my swing tank so that I can, it can be a peak shaver. Let's say if your, your electrical can't support that, um, you know, it, it's, it's less common, but it, I would expect it to be more common would be to have, uh, you know, gas backups for, for those times of the year that we can't keep up. Uh, for maybe those couple days or a couple peaks throughout the year that otherwise we wouldn't be able to support. Uh, all this shows here is that we would then be uh, injecting into the swing tank with a water heater. You could do the same thing where if um, if you had a boiler and you had a reverse indirect, um, ultimately just trying to create a, a hybrid, hybrid uh, system here. Uh, this is something that I less often recommend this would be if we had two heat pump water heaters feeding electric tanks. Uh, usually I would like it just for the last tank to be, um, to have an element. And the reason for that would be to uh, just as, as a boost or peak shaver versus if the first tank in series starts dropping a temp, I wouldn't want that element kicking on and then kind of sandwiching the, the water. Um, we have some, we have some sizing software, just going through the storage tanks. Try not to talk too much about our stuff specifically, more of just the concepts that challenges that we come into with, with water piping and sequence. Um, George, what time do we stop for, for food? Uh, should I go on to Cogen and yeah, let's give it a check. I'll just mention a little bit about this. So this is a, this is a product that we've had. Um, we don't have it exclusively anymore, uh, the, but it is something that we do offer um, has anybody here worked with any CHP or Cogen? Any Cogen? Okay. All right. So this one, this is pretty fascinating. This is uh, what we have here is you've got you've got this uh, blue and gray box. What it is is it's uh, essentially a Toyota forklift engine. What we're doing, we've got a liquid cooled jacket in this blue portion. We've got heat exchangers and pumps in in this unit, and then we have all electrical in here. What we're doing is it's to simplify it the most. It's a generator that we're absorbing, we're taking the heat off of, producing electricity for the building, and then we're dumping the heat into domestic and space heating. Um, Try to figure out if we jump into it. So this unit, it has, um, in terms of electrical efficiency, we're at 31%. Uh, heat, we're at 62, and our low heat value is 93. Um, just to uh, to to think of it as whenever we're putting one fuel source in, we're getting we're, we're harnessing two outputs out. Uh, that would be uh, cogeneration of two items. We're good. Okay, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to stop for food, and um, I don't want to get into the cogen presentation until then. We'll come back in about fifteen. Right. So everybody's got their software. I'm sure whether it's Keiko, Grunfuss, everybody does. Uh, ultimately, people tend to use what they're most comfortable with. Just wanted to give you a run through on, on how ours operates. And then um, we can take a little bit of look at the heat exchangers. Oh, it's okay. You know, good, good call here. There we go. We're good. Perfect. All right. So this is a uh, ESP system wise. This is a Bell and Gossett selection software. So uh, as I mentioned before, whether it's a, a pump selection, whether it's uh, the trim around the pump. So if you were to go select a pump, it would give you your suction diffuser, triple duty valve. If you're looking at air separators, whether it's a mag separator, coalescing, 
smaller or centrifugal unit. Uh, expansion tank selections, as George went through and um, and uh, and mentioned about how we would go about selecting a unit. Uh, this is uh, these systems simplify it quite a bit here. And if you have a difficulty with trying to figure out what some of these items may be, I just click the eye and I'll fill you in. What I wanted to pull this up for was just so that we could take a look at at heat exchangers. Um, there's nothing too complicated about it, but let's say if we begin with ESP thermal. So this is where I was mentioning, you, know, you have your, your option for your brace plate unit, your gasket, U-tube, uh, and a tank heater. A tank heater is one that I didn't mention. Ultimately, that's just a, just a tube bundle that you would have in a shell and tube unit, but it's just placed into a tank. So lock and bar, we call it a hot water generator. People have a bunch of different names for it. Uh, but really, that's all it is, is. It's just a tube bundle placed inside of a tank. Um, as you'll not notice, by selecting the gasketed plain frame heat exchanger, uh, this gasketed PHE, then it gives us the AHRI 400 as the default option. Um, and so I mean, from down here, you can go down and make your selections. Just wanted to show you that. If you did use it for, uh, for, for steam as a steam condenser, you'll notice that it'll bring us to the industrial type. But um, just run through a, a quick selection. So in this case, we got the gasket unit, HRI 400, standard 400. And so let's say we can let a couple variables float, right? So if we know that our load, let's do simple math here, is 500,000 BTUs an hour, and we know that we have, uh, let's say if you even have a 20 degree delta T, well, we know that that would give us our 50 gallons a minute roughly. Um, granted though, at your different water temperature, uh, it'll factor in um, beyond just the standard using one for specific gravity and you know, also as the specific heat. So um, just wanted to show here that we'd have, let's say we did, uh, let's go more realistic. Let's go 180, we'll go to 160. And then over here, let's say that uh, we've got uh, 120 to uh, 140. And then if we just and uh, let's see, that was supposed to be 140. Oops, 140. And then we let the flow rates float. It's going to pop up with our flow rates. Let's say we've got 10 PSI, 10 PSI. Fouling factor, you may see like a triple zero two five, or you may not put anything. If you put too much of a fouling factor, and you, you're you're trying to plan for 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 uh, too much fouling. Uh, you could actually get less turbulence in your flow and less turbulence in your flow. You could end up um, uh, do the opposite of what your attentions were in, in putting the fouling factor. Um, so when you start putting fouling factor and then having excess plate capacity, um, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's also another point of diminishing returns. So here's the standard selection. All that you would do is you'd verify. Everything looks good. Shows you, shows you your heat transfer. You'd select next. Uh, from here, you can select, select your, your plate type. If you have any uh, standard, um, if you have any specific uh, plate thickness that you want to specify, uh, an additional capacity. Um, for the most part, we'd usually leave it at its, at its standard of, of 304 with a, um, and you would see that it would be a 0.4 for, for that, that plate thickness. A standard gasket, unless we start working with, um, with uh, some really uh, caustic chemicals, uh, for the most part with water at reasonable pressures and temperatures, um, a lot of the default settings are going to cover everything that we're trying to do. So let's say if we just move forward and we selected to calculate, what you'll notice is you have here is the price factor. So um, just so you have an idea of where where each of these items stand, where you say, okay, well, I did set the limit to, to 10 PSI, uh, but it, uh, and I've got 8.6 here, and I would like maybe this lower one, uh, closer to six. Well, you'd realize, well, that's that's 0.89 grayers. It's almost twice the price of that unit. And then start looking at lead times. So we give a handful of options just so that you can figure out what your priorities are. Maybe your priority is is a quick turnaround on some products. Maybe it's uh, restrictions in terms of um, in terms of uh, dimensions, where you say I only have so much so much of a height here. Um, or you might also have, you know, just for different uh, weight limits on some items. So let's say if we were to select the top one, generally, if um, 
uh, that would be what you would select. If you don't select the top one, then it may even be worth going back to that first section where you have your performance requirements and tightening the tolerance on whatever you do on the purpose for why you select one of the lower ones, because uh, then it'll give you more options. Uh, but what you have here is you, you just get a, you select to get your summary, your details, uh, some dimensions. That's just kind of the, the start of it, just so you can select the right one. From there, you could put on some of any sort of your accessory items, so whether you want to put an insulation blanket, or if you want to have special material types or connection types for your unit without getting too far into this. Ultimately, you would then be able to select, get a 3D model of the unit. You could get maybe some PDF drawings of the unit. Um, say if we generate, we get our specification sheet. And so we could see here, the model of the unit, entering leaving water temperatures for both sides, our pressure drop. Down here, it gives us our details about even our plate mix, like what kind of chevron powder you have. Also material type, it gives you everything there on that spec sheet. And so pretty straightforward. I don't wanna waste anyone's too much time on that. Um, is there anyone that has any questions about heat exchanger selections in the software? I think, I think you guys could probably all explore and figure it out. Um, and when it comes to the selection software, as I mentioned before, um, everybody's got their version. So maybe you're familiar with the Takeo, the Grunfuss, uh, or maybe even uh, familiar with ours. Um, I'd say that there's, uh, what we try to do is we try to learn from a lot of the other softwares and, um, and just try to define features that we would want. And um, I think Bell and Goss has done a good job, We've kind of been forward with it. In this case, we can we can look at the different product families. So if you want a an end suction pump, you say, okay, well, this is a 50, this is a E1510. So this is a, a base, a frame mounted end suction unit. So maybe you could look at the different pumps, different reasons. From there, you can make your selections. Um, back to, I guess, what I was mentioning before about jobs. Each job is going to have, you're going to have your own goals, right? So, so what you prioritize for one job versus another job may vary. Maybe one job you want to have a small footprint. Maybe you want to have really good part load efficiency. Maybe another job, you say, um, you know, there's there's different parties. So ultimately, what I'm what I'm getting at is that for each one of these selections, you can sort them by whatever you're prioritizing. Are you prioritizing that part load efficiency value? If you are, you can you can do that there. Maybe say I want to be at a certain RPM, or I have constraints with NPSHA or let's say maybe you've, you want to go with a, with a lower cost and maybe we're looking at it from here and we say, okay, I'm going to s separate it by duty point efficiency, but I'm going to keep in mind this column. Um, these items are all uh, items you can change. So in this case, the ones that you see here are just ones that I've used to select, but if you have something that's really guiding your project that you can go in and you can tailor what you, how you're ranking your selections based on that more commonly, um, what I do is I want to see, sometimes I'll be looking at a couple different series and I'll say, you know, wh what is a good fit? I want to really find the best fit. I, this, the series doesn't matter so much for me. The, the site is quite flexible. Um, and in that case, I want to the series because um, when I'm seeing them all in comparison, um, it's just one of the items. So series, you want to know your pump size, probably your RPM is a good one. You want to know your brake horsepower, uh, you're not, or you're not overloading. Uh, wire to water efficiency is a big one. So these one, these are the ones that really I picked, but by any means, select them to, to what fits your preference. You don't have to stay with whatever the default is. Um, no, one of them in there is actually footprint. So if, if you do have footprint on your mind, then you can adjust it to, uh, where's it here? Uh, you, you can go to you know, footprint. So just um, with these tools, there's there's a there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Let me see. Let me try to zoom out. There we go. Does that pop up on the screen any better? All right. So let's just give it a quick run through. This is this class can be shorter than the others. Get you out early, but uh, and leave it open to the conversation after. So I don't want to want to spend too much time on anything. So let's say we select this. We selected this unit. By doing that, we were able to get more detail. Now, so in that detail, we can see our horsepower curves. We see where the impeller trim is, that we're, we're bringing that RPM down to hit this duty point. You see what it, that it, if it was at a full RPM, where its capacity could be. So that's a little bit of a buffer there. Um, you can see a lot of these details before deciding, am I going to put it on the schedule? So let's say if you were going to put it on the schedule, let's just say we were going to call it P1. 
Now, if we do that, we've got a, a couple of different options. You could say, okay, do I want to have uh, do I want to have a pump controller? Or do I want to have a motor mounted uh, drive? And if you did something like that, it's as easy as saying, okay, I want to have a pump controller. This is my voltage. Uh, let's say that we're, we're three phase, make a selection. And from there, it's going to add all the details of the schedule. And when you export data, you'll already have a properly matched unit that matches your unit. Um, in addition, trim items. You know, trim items are makes it nice and easy to do the trim items. And then let's say if, for instance, if somebody had trouble with the project, right? And you say, you know, some, something's not right or I want some input on it. Um, if something's not right, you could actually email me and say, hey, I've got this project going on. And if you titled the project, you know, you labeled it, whatever or whatever it is, I could search all the projects in the Northeast and I could take a look at it and say, you know, I like selection one, two, three, um, or you can export it. Um, there's a million different different ways to do it, but um, without spending the whole time on this. So we've got pump selection, got the trim items, air separators, makes it nice and easy. We put 500 gallons a minute for the pump, so it assumed 500 gallons a minute. When we do that, pops up with a handful of selections what the pressure drop of each unit would be. And then see with strainer, without strainer. So if you're selecting it, it makes it just really intuitive to be able to say, okay, air vents, all the trim items. Uh, let's see. Uh, does anyone have any challenges with softwares or would like a software to do anything that, um, that, that you haven't seen yet? No. Who has a software that they work with regularly? I imagine we all do. No. Who's uh? So who's selecting the pumps? Are you, are you you guys selecting the pumps or? Yeah. Yeah. What what have you found to be the easiest software to use? Okay. Yep. Okay. And um, yeah. There's there's a there's a handful of them, and they're all going back and forth trying to add the same features. And a lot of times it's going to come down to who you're most familiar with at first. Um. But uh, this one's pretty robust, and I guess it can be intimidating at the start. But if there is anything that uh, people want to see, uh, let's see, is this software free to download? Yeah, so this, uh, there's a question online from Emma. Uh, so the software is, is online. It's, it's free. You can have it on your phone um, just to do it online. It's pretty reasonably compatible with mobile. So if you're looking for an on-the-fly dynamic submittal, you can just put that in. Um, it's uh, it's no charge. You know, in the past we'd have it as a uh, as a desktop icon, um, but you know, nowadays you know, we just have it as a favorites. I guess uh, remotely, I think that uh, unless anyone has any questions, what I'll do is I'm going to follow up with everybody's PDHs in an email because if you ever do need to prove that you you have the PDHs, it's probably easier for them to sort them electronically. Um, so we'll we'll send that to everybody, um, and then when it comes to what else. These ones in person, I guess uh, I, I still have to sign those. Other than that, um, I think we should have everything updated on the Dropbox uh, within the next day or so. And then if, uh, if people have any questions or feedback, I mean, we uh, what we try to do is we try to leave a little bit, uh, try to leave a little bit at the end for discussion if people have any questions about ongoing projects or uh, a lot of times we can learn a lot from what's going on in other people's projects. Anyone have anything? All right, well, I think remotely, thank you all. What we'll do is uh, I'll, we'll send out those details, but um, what I'll do is I'll follow up with everybody with an email. Um, and then if there are any items that we want to spend more time on that uh, relate to hydronics or any of the fringe conversation, uh, we have lunch and learns on those topics. It's just, it's tough to not jump into refrigeration or something without having a full conversation. But if people want to go down that route or heat pumps, um, so what I'd like to think of is the only thing unique, I guess, about our offering is that we kind of have the whole offering. And so we're not going to be biased to one product or another. We've got we have everything from electric boilers, gas boilers, um, you know, heat pump water heaters, cogen systems, we we've, we've steam equipment, we're kind of all over the place. So you just want an honest approach of, of application. I think that's one thing we can offer. So 
Awesome. Well, thanks everybody online and uh, we'll see if there's any conversation we have here in person. Thank you.